<clears throat> so there's the title. Uh, and one of the things I've been saying since uh, the series began is that the research I've been reporting to you is resolutely interdisciplinary. Uh, but this talk is, uh, and resolutely collaborative as well, but this talk is collaborative in a more intensive sense that in the other talks I've been reporting to you some of the uh, findings of collaborative research projects. Uh, but this talk uh, was actually put together collectively. Uh, so uh, I think it's only reasonable to add my co-authors' names to the title. Um, and they are Joshua Noeb, who's in the back of the room, I'm delighted to see, because he'll be able to help me on the hard questions. And unfortunately, Dan Kelly couldn't be here. Um, and that's bad news, because I'll need his help on some of the questions, too, I'm sure. Uh, one thing I should say before I proceed is that uh, there are a few slides which are not collaborative. Uh, at various points when we were going over them, uh, both Joshua and Dan complained, saying, you can't say all those nice things about us uh, when we're in the audience or when we're co-authors. It would seem immodest. And they are both uh, <clears throat> extremely uh, modest and gracious people. So the slides in which I say exceptionally favorable things about Joshua and Dan, uh, those are mine alone. The rest is collaborative. All right, so uh, let's start. Uh, let me locate the topic in philosophical space, as Wilfred Sellers uh, used to say. Uh, so for a long time, philosophers have offered accounts of uh, the psychological processes or mechanisms that underlie uh, spontaneous moral judgment or intuitive moral judgment. And in recent years, of course, uh, psychologists have also gotten into the act uh, offering much more sophisticated and elaborate theories about the mechanisms underlying intuitive moral judgment. Uh, however, moral philosophers uh, to whatever, even moral philosophers who rely um, extremely heavily on moral intuitions or spontaneous moral judgments uh, have always been very clear that at least from time to time, under certain circumstances, they're not to be trusted. Uh, <clears throat> although, of course, there's considerable disagreement about just when skepticism is warranted about moral intuitions. Well, our goal in this talk uh, is to sketch uh, what we think is a newly emerging perspective, uh, it's not ours alone, it's coming out of a variety of groups thinking about these things, a newly emerging perspective on the mechanisms underlying moral intuition. Indeed, uh, well, I won't address this hardly at all in this talk, I think it's a newly emerging perspective on the mechanisms underlying a lot of different uh, uh, cognitive uh, processes. Uh, but uh, we're going to look at uh, how the perspective applies to moral intuitions and to begin at least to explore its implications uh, for a very hotly debated topic in philosophy, namely whether and indeed when uh, um, intuition should be relied upon. All right, uh, well, uh, philosophers have typically assumed that the mechanisms underlying moral intuition and moral judgment are well designed, well designed for something or other. They, of course, disagree about what they're well designed for. Uh, but uh, we think there are now uh, emerging reasons, uh, lots of them, in fact, uh, for thinking that those mechanisms, in fact, aren't well designed for anything. Uh, rather, uh, to use a term, uh, uh, slang term, I guess, from computer science, uh, we think uh, a great deal of moral psychology is a kludge. Uh, <clears throat> indeed, it's uh, worse than a kludge. Uh, it's a whole bunch of kludges. It's a hodgepodge of multi-purpose kludges. So uh, that's going to be uh, one of the main conclusions that we'll be aiming at uh, and then exploring the implications of that. All right, but before uh, explaining and defending our reasons for thinking uh, that, uh, I need to say a little bit about uh, some of the reasons that philosophers, both classical and contemporary, uh, have given for uh, discounting or uh, putting aside or ignoring the urgings of moral intuitions. Uh, a lot could be said here, uh, but just to give you a flavor of the space, 
uh, I'll look at three different kinds of examples. Uh, first of all, reasons that emerge from the moral sense and ideal observer traditions, a uh, tradition that I talked about in, I guess, the second lecture. Uh, secondly, uh, a very brief look uh, at the kinds of considerations for discounting or ignoring intuitions uh, that grow out of the idea of reflective equilibrium. And finally, something on a very different note, namely uh, evolutionary arguments uh, aimed at broadly debunking intuitions, giving us a very different account of when and why we should ignore them. All right, let me start with the moral sense and ideal observer traditions. Of course, a lot to be said here. Um, as we saw in the, I guess, the second lecture, uh, ideal observer theorists typically maintain that our moral intuitions are correct or justified when they're made under appropriate or ideal conditions. But of course, they recognize uh, that when they're made uh, under conditions that aren't ideal, for example, we have false beliefs, uh, the people making them are irrational, a bunch of other considerations, then uh, our intuitions are not to be trusted. And I think we get a particularly good um, uh, <clears throat> representation of this kind of view if we go back to the work of Francis Hutchinson, who is one of the important precursors of the uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, ideal observer and moral sense story. Uh, so what Hutchinson tells us uh, is that uh, <clears throat> moral judgments, uh, he doesn't use the word moral intuitions, of course, moral judgments are a product of the moral sense. And that moral sense was implanted in us uh, by the author of nature, by God. Uh, so presumably that moral sense uh, can be relied upon to do a pretty good job when it's doing its job properly. But Hutchinson recognizes that that sense, like any other sense, like taste or smell or vision, uh, can mislead when the conditions are unfavorable. So, uh, <clears throat> of course, lots more to be said about this, but I'm trying just to give you a flavor of the historical background. Uh, jump now uh, to uh, Jack Rawls uh, and his decision procedure for ethics. Uh, what I have in mind here is, of course, the reflective equilibrium story that people, myself included, until very recently, uh, associated with Rawls' 71 book, A Theory of Justice. Turns out that um, 20 years before that, he published a paper called The Decision Procedure for Ethics, where he sketched just that reflective equilibrium procedure, although he didn't give it that name back in 51. Well, as I suppose almost everyone in the room knows, the way reflective equilibrium works is uh, <clears throat> you're trying to um, uh, bring intuitions at several levels into accord with one another. Intuitions about particular cases, intuitions about moral principles, uh, and if they don't immediately agree with one another, something has to give. Uh, and as Rawls and everybody else who has thought about this uh, recognizes, sometimes in order to do that, an intuition about a particular case is going to have to be rejected uh, considered uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, to be put aside and not taken account of in your serious moral deliberation. That's narrow reflective equilibrium, uh, but uh, Rawls and later scholars have also articulated a view or a procedure uh, that I think Norm Daniels may have been the first person to refer to as wide reflective equilibrium. Uh, and this is a more demanding process. Here, uh, you bring your intuitions about particular cases and about moral principles into accord with the rest of your belief structure. Uh, and that includes, really, the rest of your belief structure, your belief about scientific matters, history, politics, even metaphysics and semantics, uh, if they prove relevant. Well, in wide reflective equilibrium, uh, pretty clearly, even more of our intuitions about particular cases are going to have to be rejected or discounted. Well, the third uh, tradition I want to look at by way of background uh, for the idea of rejecting moral intuitions is a tradition that Joshua and Dan and I are much closer to. Um, it's a tradition that grows out of evolutionary arguments and probably the most uh, eminent um, and influential person in that tradition is Peter Singer. Uh, so he first pursued this line of argument uh, at uh, considerable depth uh, in his 1981 book, The Expanding Circle. And then in a paper published uh, just uh, two years ago, in 2002, 
called Ethics and Intuition, he picked up the theme uh, and developed the argument in an interesting new way that I'll sketch for you in a moment, uh, relying on some findings uh, in the cognitive neuroscience of ethics. All right, let me start by uh, saying a little bit about what Singer said in the expanding circle. There, he focuses on a number of cases, but one that's center stage uh, is nepotistic intuitions, intuitions that maintain that in various domains we ought to value the welfare of our kin or our tribesmen more than the welfare outside of people in those circles. Uh, and he notes, um, uh, <clears throat> in accord with the wisdom of the time, that the psychological processes leading to judgments of that sort uh, were almost certainly adaptive in an ancestral environment. Uh, and indeed, uh, there's no reason to deny that many of them still are uh, uh, adaptive. Uh, <clears throat> okay? But, Singer goes on to argue, once we see why these nepotistic tribal instincts or tribal intuitions have emerged, we can also see that there's no good reason to use them uh, in a decision procedure for ethics. Uh, rather, uh, once we see their history, in this case the revolutionary history, uh, we should discount them. Well, let me skip now to his 2005 paper where he develops this idea uh, <clears throat> in a new context. Uh, and there he focuses on trolley problems of the sort that have recently been uh, <clears throat> much discussed in the philosophical literature. Are there people in the room who don't know uh, what trolley problems are? Nobody doesn't? Oh, well, <laughs> Uh oh, good, a few honest people. All right, uh, so let me very quickly, trolley problems are moral dilemmas first introduced into the moral literature, I think, uh, uh, by Judy Jarvis Thompson about 25 or 30 years ago. Uh, and uh, the uh, standard versions go like this. Version number one, uh, <clears throat> you happen to be an observer seeing a runaway train, a trolley, uh, that <clears throat> is going to go down that track. Uh, but you happen to be standing near a switch which can deflect the trolley onto this track. On this track, there are five people uh, who can't escape. Uh, so if you do nothing, those five people will be killed by the trolley. If you deflect it onto this track, there's one person who can't escape, so he'll be killed. Uh, right? So uh, <clears throat> that's uh, uh, case number one. And the overwhelming majority of people, not everyone, but the overwhelming majority of people have the intuition, uh, yes, you should deflect the trolley onto that track. Uh, the other case, uh, so that's the standard case, uh, the so-called footbridge case, uh, looks in many ways quite like it. Uh, you've got uh, a runaway trolley. Uh, it's going to hit these five people and kill them. They can't escape. The only thing you can do to stop the trolley uh, is you're a very small person yourself, so you can't sacrifice yourself, right? Uh, but there is this very large person standing on a footbridge over the trolley track, uh, and you can push him into the path of the trolley, stopping the trolley, uh, killing the one innocent person, uh, and saving five. Uh, and the standard finding there, uh, both amongst philosophers informally, but also looking at serious research on this topic, uh, is that uh, so three, three quarters, uh, perhaps 80% of people think, uh, no, in this case, it would be terrible to push the fat guy off the footbridge. All right, those are trolley problems. Well. Following the work of Josh Green, uh, who put people in uh, fMRI scanners uh, while they were deliberating about uh, trolley problems, uh, Singer maintains that neuroscientific evidence suggests that intuitions about footbridge cases are the result of emotional reactions to cases in which, and this is the crucial part, harm is caused by the sort of interactions that would have or might have occurred in an ancestral environment. Okay? So that's the claim, uh, right or wrong. Uh, what's interesting about it is how uh, Singer elaborates the philosophical morals of this. So uh, let me walk you through a little bit of what he says. He says, the salient feature that explains our different intuitive judgments concerning the two cases is that the footbridge case is the kind of situation that was likely to arise in the eons of time over which we were evolving. Whereas the standard trolley case, the throwing the lever case, uh, describes a way of bringing about someone's death that has only been possible in the last century or two. But what's the moral salience of the fact that I have killed someone in a way that was possible a million years ago, rather than in a way that became possible only 200 years ago? I would answer none. 
And he goes on to draw a more general moral about philosophical methodology from this. He says, at a more general level, this casts serious doubt on the method of reflective equilibrium. There's little point in constructing a moral theory designed to match considered moral judgments that themselves stem from our evolved responses to the situations in which we and our ancestors lived during the period of our evolution as social mammals, primates, and finally human beings. We should, with our current powers of reasoning and our rapidly changing circumstance, be able to do better than that. And his grand conclusion, what I am saying in brief is this. Advances in our understanding of ethics undermine some conceptions of doing ethics. Those conceptions of ethics tend to be too respectful of our intuitions. Our better understanding of ethics gives us grounds for being less respectful of them. Well, there's Singer's view, and I want to stress that we're not really taking deeply serious uh, issue with Singer. Uh, we agree with his skepticism, or at least parts of his skepticism about intuition, but uh, our major theme is we don't think Singer's skepticism about intuition goes far enough, okay? because there is, in fact, uh, an assumption that both Singer, on the one hand, a skeptic about intuitions, as they're used in ethics, and the friends of intuitions, reflective equilibrium theorists, moral sense theorists, there's uh, an assumption that they share about intuition, uh, and that's the assumption that the psychological systems underlying our moral intuitions were well designed. Okay? Uh, so there's some point or reason for the intuitive moral judgments that people make when the system is working po uh, properly, even though, of course, for Singer, unlike for the friends of intuitions, uh, <clears throat> the function that the system was designed for is of dubious moral importance. Uh, so the intuitions aren't to be taken seriously. Nonetheless, nonetheless the intuitions uh, <clears throat> were the product of a mechanism designed to do something and doing it well. Uh, we think uh, that the uh, engine of moral intuition is not well designed at all. Far from being the sort of elegant machine that you read about in the works of Tubi and Cosmides and other high church evolutionary psychologists, we think the mechanisms underlying moral intuition, and as I said uh, earlier, I think a, an emerging view is lots of other me cognitive mechanisms as well, uh, <clears throat> are in fact a kludge. That is to say, it's a cluster of mechanisms cobbled together rather awkwardly from bits and pieces of mental machinery, pre-existing mental machinery for the most part, most of which were designed for functions that have nothing or little to do with morality. Uh, so, uh, in thinking about, uh, you know, I showed this to my wife and she said, what's a kludge? Uh, maybe a better way to explain this uh, using a term more familiar uh, here uh, is that, I think this means the same thing, I think what we're saying uh, is that the mechanisms underlying moral intuition uh, are a bricolage uh, in the sense uh, introduced into the literature, I think independently, uh, by Francois Jacob uh, and Claude Lévi-Strauss. Well, it's our contention that this um, kludgy or bricolage nature uh, of uh, moral, of the mechanisms, explains lots of quirks in moral intuition, and it also provides a reason to be skeptical about moral intuition uh, and their use in moral de deliberation, quite independent of the kinds of reasons that already exist in the literature. All right, so now let me give you an overview of what I want to do in the rest of the talk. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to spend a good deal of the talk uh, giving you examples of the kludginess, uh, as it were, or the uh, uh, bricolaginess, uh, if that's a word, uh, of the mechanisms undermining, under, uh, mind, underlying moral intuition. That suggests I should have some water. Uh, the first example I want to focus on uh, is the work of Dan Kelly uh, on moral disgust. And the second example I want to focus on uh, is some very recent work of Joshua Nobes uh, on intentionality judgments and unconscious moral judgments. And then the last part of the talk, um, I'll go as far as I can, and let me warn you that it's not as far as I wish I could go uh, at saying, what exactly are the lessons we should take uh, about how to do ethics from the kludginess of the mechanisms underlying moral intuitions? <clears throat>
All right, so that's where I'm going. Uh, let me start with Kelly on disgust. Uh, and here, uh, I'm at a, a sort of real disadvantage because uh, Dan Kelly, who's just finishing up uh, a degree uh, at uh, Rutgers and starting a job uh, at Purdue University, uh, has written this really extraordinary piece of uh, work. Uh, it's a rich, detailed, nuanced, uh, <clears throat> empirically supported account of the psychological mechanisms underlying disgust, which he argues, I think, completely persuasively are a uniquely human system. And he also gives uh, what I take to be a uh, remarkably compelling account of how that system evolved. Unfortunately, uh, it's a big story. Uh, it will uh, ultimately, I suppose, be published as a two or 300 page monograph. Uh, and in this talk, I'm only going to have time to sketch a few of the central theses uh, that come out of Kelly's work on uh, disgust. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> even more unfortunately, I'm really not going to be able to even give you a flavor for the rich empirical support that he brings to these claims. All right, so uh, I'm going to tell you about two bits of Kelly's thesis uh, uh, about disgust. Uh, the first is uh, what he calls the entanglement thesis. Uh, the idea here is uh, <clears throat> disgust itself is a kludge. It's a uniquely human emotion produced by the merger of two distinct emotional systems or two distinct cognitive systems. Uh, the second uh, <clears throat> is the co-optation thesis. Uh, which says, after these two systems uh, merged in humans, uh, it was co-opted by a bunch of other systems that were then emerging, including the norm system that we spoke about uh, earlier and I guess, the uh, first and second talk, and also the ethnic boundary system, uh, which were in turn central, crucial elements in the emergence of human ultra-sociality. Well, as I say, Kelly assembles a, a really vast array of uh, evidence uh, for uh, these claims from the neuroscience, social psychology, cognitive psychology, developmental psychology, evolutionary psychology, and from uh, gene culture coevolution theory. And as usual, the devil is in the details. Uh, so the best I can do here is join uh, another great fan of Kelly's work, namely Mr. Disgust himself. That's not supposed to be an insult. That's, I realized when I <clears throat> thought, how am I going to say this? Uh, uh, Paul Rosen is uh, the leading figure in the psych and the pioneer, really, in the psychology of disgust. Uh, and uh, Paul, uh, who uh, ran across Dan's work about a year ago, uh, is as much of a fan as it, uh, of it as I am. All right, so let me just tell you a few things about disgust that are relevant to motivating the entanglement thesis. First of all, disgust exhibits a really puzzling array of elicitors. It's really hard to figure out why any particular emotion should have these elicitors. Uh, and uh, those elicitors uh, generate uh, an equally, or evoke an equally puzzling cluster of responses. So let me talk first of all about the elicitors. Amongst the elicitors of disgust are certain kinds of food, uh, dog meat, grubs, insects. Uh, you'll <clears throat> be happy to know, uh, that'll be the last photo I'll show you, uh, but <clears throat> um, uh, on this uh, topic, uh, substances associated with the body, feces, vomit, spit, organic decay, but also people who are associated, uh, uh, people and objects that are associated with illness. A shirt once worn by a person with leprosy evokes disgust. Certain sexual practices, necrophilia and incest. Certain moral transgressions and transgressors, uh, like rape, torture, child molestation. And members of low status outgroups, untouchables, Jews, uh, and so on. All of these evoke disgust. But of course, some of these elicitors are pan-cultural, uh, like those. Uh, <clears throat> feces, vomit, organic decay. Others are uh, culturally local or indeed idiosyncratic to the individual, uh, like those. On the response side, uh, disgust is equally complex and equally puzzling. It includes uh, <clears throat> a gape face, which is occasionally accompanied by feelings of, or in the rarest and extreme case, actual retching, okay? feelings of nausea, a sense of oral incorporation, a sense that somehow uh, the mouth and the digestive system is involved, 
a quick withdrawal, a, a more sustained and cognitive sense of offensiveness, and a more sustained and cognitive sense of contamination. Well, a very natural question to ask here is, how are all these things related? And indeed, until Dan's work, uh, now, there are a couple of suggestions in the literature, uh, one of which I'll mention in passing later on, uh, but they really were, uh, I think, hopelessly implausible and not well supported by the data. Uh, the entanglement thesis uh, that Kelly has developed maintains uh, that the human emotion of disgust is the result of a fusion of two distinct mechanisms. Each of these mechanisms has a homologous counterpart, indeed lots of homologous counterparts in other related species, but the two have only combined in humans. One of the mechanisms, uh, which Dan calls the poison avoidance mechanism, is directly linked to digestion. It evolved to regulate food intake and protect the gut against ingested substances that are either poisonous or otherwise harmful. It was designed to expel substances entering the gastrointestinal system through the mouth, thus the retching. Okay? Uh, and it was also designed to acquire new elicitors very quickly. Uh, it's a very good evolutionary idea that if something has made you uh, <clears throat> wretch, uh, it's a good thing uh, to uh, uh, be disgusted by it in the future, even if you weren't in the past. And the famous work of John Garcia, uh, of course, uh, is evidence that uh, for gut-induced distress, uh, we get uh, the very uh, rapid, indeed usually one case, generation of new elicitors. All right, the other mechanism that joined uh, with uh, this one uh, is what uh, Kelly refers to as the parasite avoidance mechanism. It evolved for a very different evolutionary purpose, although of course they do overlap to a certain extent, uh, namely to protect against infections from pathogens and parasites by avoiding them. Uh, <clears throat> of course, some pathogens and parasites are ingested, but this mechanism isn't uh, restricted to ingestion, but it serves to guard against coming uh, <clears throat> in close proximity with infectious agents. Uh, this involves avo avoiding not only visible pathogens and parasites, but also, of course, places and substances and other organisms that might be harboring them. Okay? And uh, let me go back. Uh, uh, Dan, amongst other things, presents uh, a fair amount of evidence uh, indicating that both of these systems uh, are uh, well developed in other organisms, including organisms close to us evolutionarily. Uh, well, <clears throat> let's see, the elements traceable to the disgust response, uh, <clears throat> sorry, the elements of the disgust response that are traceable to the poison, poison avoidance system are the gape face, the feeling of nausea, the sense of oral incorporation, and on Kelly's theory, uh, <clears throat> these are the elements uh, that are traceable to the poison avoidance system, quick withdrawal, uh, cognitive sense of offensiveness, and contamination. On the elicitor side, uh, that's the one uh, that's traceable to the poison avoidance system, and those three are traceable to the parasite avoidance system. Well, you might ask, what's the evidence for this? Uh, as I said, there's a lot of it, vastly more than I could squeeze into uh, a talk of this sort, but let me just mention a few intriguing bits and pieces. Uh, one of them uh, is that uh, the different components of the disgust response have a dramatically different developmental trajectory or schedule. So, distaste and the gape response are present very early on, within the first year of life, whereas contamination sensitivity emerges significantly later, apparently some debate about exactly how significantly later, uh, but uh, <clears throat> notoriously uh, little children uh, don't have this kind of contamin contamination sensitivity. However, once the system is fully in place, the components of the response are produced together. Uh, they form what philosophers of science sometimes call a nomological cluster. That is to say, any elicitor of disgust, regardless of uh, which system it was originally related to, will produce all or most of the cluster of components uh, in uh, the disgust profile. Well, uh, in thinking about disgust, Almost everybody who has pushed it even a little bit has recognized that there's a puzzle. 
Uh, it really is a weird and puzzling emotion. So why should, for example, the sight of a festering sore or the sight of a, a, a badly deformed person with leprosy, why should that evoke a gape face or a, <clears throat> a feeling of nausea? Uh, and Kelly's theory provides a, a solution, a solution uh, <clears throat> that uh, I think a satisfying one. Uh, and it's just, he also provides solutions to a lot of other puzzles in the area, namely uh, that disgust is a kludge. Uh, so <clears throat> you had two distant sy different systems, they got nailed together, uh, and you're now getting uh, the uh, response appropriate to one system triggered by uh, the uh, elicitor uh, <clears throat> that originally came along with the other system. Uh, that's why a gaping sore makes you feel nauseous. But if it's a kludge, uh, <clears throat> as uh, uh, Kelly contends, it's a kludge which, with features uh, that could be readily co-opted and put to use as humans began living in larger groups and human ultrasociality emerged. Uh, <clears throat> so that gets us on to the second part of Kelly's, uh, uh, the second thesis uh, in Kelly's work that I want to talk about, uh, namely the co-optation thesis. First idea here is that the gape face itself very quickly took on uh, the role of a signal. Of, <clears throat> of a signal. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> core idea, as group size increases, uh, there was an increased need for a perspicuous signal, warning of dangerous foods, and infectious or risks of infectious illness. In humans, of course, uh, the face and facial expressions uh, are a rich source of uh, information about social phenomena, and so the gape face, which clearly has its roots uh, in the facial motions accompanying retching, was co-opted as a signal, a signal warning others not just against toxic foods, but also against the presence of parasites and contagious pathogens. Okay? Uh, so it uh, was there, uh, picked up, uh, and now used uh, as, a, as a signal. Uh, but then this whole process uh, gets, on Kelly's view, uh, co-opted by the norm system. Okay? As group size increased, uh, there was increased need for social coordination. And as we saw in the second lecture, uh, the norm system uh, plays an important role in facilitating social coordination. So it's one, hardly the only, uh, uh, cognitive mechanism uh, that's contributing to uh, <clears throat> coordination and therefore the possibility of larger group living or ultrasociality. And the discuss system has features that make it an obvious candidate to be co-opted by the norm system as it evolved, and indeed Kelly maintains that's exactly what happens. Uh, it was uh, co-opted by the norm system as it evolved. So you may recall uh, that the uh, architecture of norms I sketched for you uh, in the second lecture, the Sropata and Stitch model, uh, suggests that compliance motivation, compliance uh, with norms, and punitive motivation are linked with uh, what Sropata, go back three or four years ago when we wrote that paper, uh, Srapata and I called the emotion system, so that was the picture I gave you. Uh, but, in fact, there's plenty now of psychological and neurological evidence that there isn't one emotion system. There are many different, or several different emotion systems, with disgust being one of them. So, um, the Srapata stitch picture gets uh, replaced by something like this. Uh, and, of course, disgust here is a natural candidate uh, for providing both compliance motivation and punitive motivation for a particular family of norms, uh, namely uh, norms that either involve intrinsically disgusting matters, like norms governing the disposal of corpses or the disposal of bodily wastes, uh, <clears throat> or other activities that are antecedently salient to the disgust system, like norms governing uh, uh, eating practices. How does this work? Uh, well, uh, really fairly straightforward. It's sort of an obvious trick for Mother Nature to pick up on, uh, given that it's lying around. So compliance motivation uh, <clears throat> uh, is generated by making the norm-violating behavior itself disgusting and therefore aversive. Why don't you do it? Uh, well, you don't do it because you find it disgusting. Uh, what about punitive motivation? Well, punitive motivation uh, is provided by 
uh, <clears throat> making the violator uh, um, himself disgusting, as it were. The violator is considered to be dirty and contaminated, uh, and therefore is to be avoided and shunned. So the picture we've got is this one, uh, that uh, <clears throat> in a natural uh, development of the norm system, disgust comes to take both a compliance role or a role in compliance motivation and putative motivation with a specific set of norms, uh, the ones that are uh, <clears throat> antecedently linked in one way or another to disgust. All right, so uh, what <clears throat> Kelly is suggesting here then is that the norm system is itself a kludge, and it's a kludge built with kludgy parts. Well, not surprisingly, a kludge built with kludgy parts can lead to some very peculiar behavior. Uh, after all, uh, <clears throat> lots of stuff jammed together, uh, <clears throat> not necessarily in any elegant design. And in fact, several recent studies, uh, some of them I think widely known to people in the group, others probably not so widely known because uh, of one or two of the ones that I'll be talking about have yet to be published. Uh, though several recent studies have focused on the fact that, uh, I mean, not surprising fact, first of all, the disgust system can of course be triggered by many things that have nothing to do with norms. But even when it's triggered by these non-moral items, uh, it can have dramatic and persistent influence on a person's judgment about moral issues. So let me tell you a little bit about some of that research. Uh, as I say, some of it, particularly the first case, I suspect more than half of you know about. Ah, yes, that's the picture. I just uh, <clears throat> figured out how to do that, so I thought I'd show you. All right. Uh, <clears throat> other emotion triggers having nothing to do with the norm system, triggering disgust, uh, affecting uh, in a profound way, moral judgment, or at least norm judgment. Well, the most famous study, I suppose, uh, is the recently published uh, paper by Wheatley and Haidt. And what they did is find some highly hypnotizable subjects, uh, and they hypnotized these subjects to feel a brief pang of disgust whenever uh, an ordinary English word, for example, often was presented to them. Okay? Uh, and then they presented uh, people with a variety of scenarios and asked them to make moral judgments. I'll just show you the, the most dramatic and disquieting of them. Uh, so uh, this is uh, one of their scenarios. Dan is a student council representative at his school. This semester he is in charge of scheduling discussions about academic issues. He often, and of course this was counterbalanced with a non-hypnotized word for other subjects, he often picks topics that appeal to both professors and students in order to stimulate discussion. Really bad guy here, right? Uh, well, the astounding finding here is that uh, many of the people who are hypnotized to feel disgust when they see the word often judge that Dan is doing something wrong. Okay? Uh, very weird and disquieting finding. Uh, finding of another, uh, a, a similar sort, um, uh, <clears throat> In fact, I guess coming out of John Haidt's lab as well, uh, when uh, Schnall was a postdoc with Haidt, um, uh, Schnall and, uh, and her um, associates have shown that people make more severe moral judgments when they're asked to make the judgments in a disgusting surrounding. Uh, so subjects in this experiment were either set down in a, in a perfectly nice clean office and given a moral judgment profile, making lots of different moral judgments, or uh, they were set down in a really disgusting office uh, that had greasy pizza boxes, a sticky chair, a dried up smoothie, and a chewed pen. Sorry, I couldn't get you all of that in one picture. So, uh, and uh, <laughs> what happens? Uh, well, uh, the uh, <clears throat> subjects who make their moral judgments, same set of questions, uh, Likert scaled and so on, uh, people who make their moral judgments in the disgusting environment are much more severe in their moral judgments. Uh, <clears throat> this looks like a kludge. Okay? Another study uh, that you might not be aware of, uh, <clears throat> has folk, or another series of studies that, that some of you might not be aware of, uh, <clears throat> focuses on uh, what might be, and here I want to stress might be, because neither I nor the investigators involved in these, I think, are 
clear enough, we just don't know enough, about exactly what the, as it were, boxology or the flowchart should look like here. Uh, but one way of reading it is what they're picking up on is downstream consequences of the disgust system uh, trigger, being triggered in moral deliberation. Uh, right? So the idea is uh, the disgust system is triggered, uh, and then there are downstream consequences. Maybe that's the right way to view these. Whatever, and one of the things I'd love to have here is some help on the right way to view these, but whatever the right way to view them is, uh, what I'm going to argue, uh, they reek of the kludgy nature of uh, the disgust system and its involvement in moral deliberation. So let me give you uh, a couple of examples. First, uh, one that's been called the Lady Macbeth effect. Uh, <clears throat> A uh, published study by John, just recently published by John and Lindquist, uh, have shown that uh, you ask subjects to recall some unethical deed uh, that they have done in their past. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Uh, and uh, that intervention, so you ask them either to recall an unethical deed or some other kind of match deed that they don't think to be unethical, uh, you then give them a choice of a variety of kinds of household products, uh, and they uh, <clears throat> strongly prefer the antiseptic wipes uh, to cleanse themselves after they have thought about <clears throat> a past moral transgression. Worse than that, uh, <clears throat> If you clean your hands after describing a past unethical deed, uh, that reduces the level of negative moral emotions like guilt that you feel. Okay? So you feel less guilt and less shame uh, if you think about something nasty you've done in the past and then wash your hands. Uh, but the one I find most disquieting, and as I say, the exact boxology, the exact way to think about uh, the information flow here is less than clear to me, uh, is this one. Uh, in addition to that, uh, they also gave these people an opportunity to volunteer to help a desperate graduate student who was having some problem with his computer having crashed or what have you. And if you've wiped your hands with the antiseptic wipe, you're le after thinking about your moral transgressions, uh, you're less likely to volunteer to help uh, the graduate student. Uh, so, I mean, maybe what's going on, we don't really know, but one speculation is, well, you're feeling less guilty. Guilt is somehow involved in your willingness to uh, uh, volunteer to help. Uh, but this suggests that these phenomena have real-world consequences. Yet another study, uh, this one unpublished, uh, Schnell uh, and Associates compared judgments about moral severity in two groups of participants. One group had just used an alcohol-based cleaning gel on their hands, right? So they've cleaned their hands with an alcohol-based cleaning gel. The other used an ordinary non-cleansing hand cream, okay? And the moral judgments used by those using the cleaning gel were significantly less severe. So you wash your hands with a cleaning gel, you make less severe moral judgments. Um, <clears throat> kind of hard to think that God designed this one. All right, uh, so I'm telling you about the co-optation thesis. Uh, let me push it a little bit further and then try to extract some conclusions. Uh, <clears throat> in addition to being co-opted by the norm system, uh, Kelly maintains that uh, the... Uh, <clears throat> Discuss system was also co-opted by the ethnic boundary marker system. Uh, Boyd and Richardson and their students uh, <clears throat> have argued that a, another crucial step in the development of human ultrasociality was the emergence of mechanisms that allow people to recognize members of their own tribe. That's important because in-group members share norms that facilitate coordination, uh, so it's good to be able to recognize who's one of you and who isn't. And since difference in cuisines and eating practices are one of the more visible correlates of uh, ethnic group membership. And since disgust is heavily involved in regulating food intake, disgust was, of course, a natural candidate to be co-opted by the emerging system of ethnic identification. Uh, <clears throat> so eating practices, both how they ate and what they ate, of outgroups uh, came to evoke disgust. And disgust, of course, came to provide a significant part of the motivation for then avoiding uh, members of outgroups. 
Okay, so what have we got? Uh, well, we've got an evolutionary, the evolutionary function of uh, uh, the boundary marker system uh, is to keep the groups apart. But it's a kludgy solution because it's keeping the groups apart uh, using the emotion of disgust with all of its other features. And this has, to put it mildly, some unpleasant consequences because in addition to keeping members of the group ap groups apart, uh, <clears throat> Uh, members of uh, uh, other groups are considered uh, or, or viewed as or sensed to be offensive and contaminating. And people who embrace different norms are often felt to be disgusting and subhuman. All right, well, there's uh, as much as I can tell you of uh, Dan's story on disgust as a kludge and its um, co-optation by the moral system, but I want to put it to use right away rather than waiting till the end of the talk to try to draw some conclusions. Uh, so I've got a little interlude here uh, that I call, obviously, Kluge meets Cass. Uh, well, you've already met Kluge. Who's Cass? Uh, Cass is Leon Cass, a, an academic at the University of Chicago, conservative bioethicist, an important man in the United States. Uh, he was chairman of the American President's Council on Bioethics uh, from 2002 to 2005. Uh, in a book he published in 2002 called Life, Liberty, and the Defense of Dignity, there's a chapter uh, with the striking title, The Wisdom of Repugnance. In that chapter, Cass maintains that in crucial cases, repugnance is the emotional expression of deep wisdom beyond reason's power to fully articulate it. Beware when people talk to you like that. Uh, he goes on to say, in this age in which everything is held to be permissible, so long as it's freely done, and in which our bodies are regarded as merely instruments of our autonomous rational will, repugnance may be the only voice left that speaks up to defend the core of our humanity. And in a line that's been widely quoted uh, in debates, at least in the United States, he says, Shallow are the souls who have forgotten how to shudder, that is to say, feel uh, <clears throat> disgust. Well, uh, <clears throat> this isn't an abstract view for Cass. He uses these claims uh, <clears throat> to play a central role uh, in his argument against human cloning uh, <clears throat> and various other sorts of genetic uh, interventions. And other people have adopted the idea and the language in arguments against abortion, pornography, same-sex marriage, and a variety of other things. Well, some philosophers, uh, most notably Martha Nussbaum, uh, have challenged Cass uh, by arguing that disgust should be discounted in our legal and moral deliberation. Uh, Martha picks up an idea that she got, actually, from Paul Rosen, which uh, I think is singularly implausible. Uh, so the core idea of why we should discount disgust uh, in Martha Nussbaum's book is roughly, very roughly, it reminds us of our animal origins and is somehow irrelevant or what have you. Well, that's not the reason we should discount disgust. Uh, I think Kelly's work provides a much more plausible and powerful critique of Cass. There isn't any wisdom in repugnance because repugnance is produced by disgust and disgust is a kludge. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> And the psychological produces, uh, system that produces moral judgments on the basis of disgust is a kludge twice over. Uh, and uh, this is actually a slide borrowed from, John, uh, from Dan Kelly's job talk. I debated long and hard whether to include this one. Uh, <clears throat> if it offends anyone, please accept my apology in advance. But it's important to see uh, that the kludgy aspect uh, <laughs> of disgust extends rather more dramatically than uh, uh, just debates in bioethics. Uh, Anti-Jewish Nazi propaganda often evoked both the imagery and the language of disgust and purity and contamination and dehumanization very fla fla flagrantly. Uh, so here is a, a poster advertising a film called The Eternal Jew. And remember that Hitler described the Jew as a maggot, a festering abscess, hidden away inside the clean and healthy body of the nation. Uh, well, so much for the wisdom of repugnance. All right, uh, so that's my first example. Second one will, I hope, take a little bit less time. 
Uh, but I want to tell you uh, some of uh, the extraordinary, uh, Joshua had no part in this slide except uh, being the subject of the picture, uh, <coughs> Uh, the extraordinarily elegant and exciting work which he's done on the way in which unconscious moral judgments, judgments which the agent may in fact explicitly reject, can nonetheless have a significant impact on a range of morally relevant intuitions. So let me, uh, uh, yes, uh, a bit of background here. Uh, let me fit this into a broader movement. Uh, so Gary uh, Marcus, uh, in his uh, um, just about to be finished book called Kluge, uh, argues that uh, more recently involved, computationally slow, computa uh, consciously accessible mental processes, the things that uh, in the trendy literature are called System 2 processes, were grafted onto older System 1 psychological systems that were designed for a very different purpose. Uh, and the kludgy architecture that results, uh, right? You've got one kind of architecture uh, <clears throat> there and in place, and you somehow got to build the other one on top of it. Uh, Marcus argues accounts for many of the quirks and shortcomings that we find in, for example, the heuristics and biases literature, some of the perception literature, and elsewhere. And before I go on, since somebody's likely to notice it, uh, I should say that uh, <clears throat> I agree uh, wholeheartedly with Gary, except on one point. Indeed, we're thinking of doing a joint uh, uh, BBS article together uh, on this stuff. Uh, the one point we cannot reach agreement on is he insists on misspelling Kluge. That way, uh, <clears throat> all right-thinking people should know that Kluge has a D in it. All right. Well, I think Joshua's work uh, provides an important and disquieting illustration of this phenomenon in the moral domain. Let me get you up to speed uh, by telling you, first of all, uh, about uh, a finding uh, that Joshua reported, what, about five years ago now, uh, that has become known in the literature uh, as the side effect effect or the nob effect. Okay? What he reports, uh, I guess 2003, so four years ago, uh, is an experiment in which participants were presented with a pair of almost identical vignettes. Uh, and I know many people know this work because it has been so influential. But here are the two vignettes, uh, uh, one in red, the other in blue on the same screen. The vice president of the company went to the chairman of the board and said, we're thinking of starting a new program. It'll help us increase profits, but it will also harm, one version, help, the other version, the environment. The chairman of the board answered, I don't care at all about harming, helping the environment. I just want to make as much profit as I can. Let's start the new program. They started the new program. Sure enough, the environment was harmed or helped. In the harm case, participants were asked how much blame the chairman deserved on a Likert scale of 0 to 6, and whether he intentionally harmed the environment. In the help case, participants were asked how much praise the chairman deserved, same scale, and whether he intentionally helped the environment. Uh, the astounding, dramatic results are, in the harm case, 82% said the chairman brought about the side effect intentionally. In the help case, 77% said the chairman did not bring about uh, the side effect intentionally. Well, Joshua's initial hypothesis about this, a very influential hypothesis, uh, was that people's moral assessments of the side effect here uh, play a substantial role in determining whether they're willing to say that the side effect was brought about intentionally. A judgment that the side effect is morally bad makes it more likely that it will be judged intentional. Now, if that's true, just as stated, uh, it's itself very disquieting because it flies in the face of the traditional wisdom uh, that judgments about whether somebody did something intentionally are, as it were, folk scientific judgments. They're judgments about fact, not judgments uh, <clears throat> with regard to value. But if that were true, it at least has a sort of obvious rationale since these judgments about whether an action is intentional play a central role in determining whether an agent deserves praise or blame. But more recent research uh, has showed that uh, if we interpret the hypothesis in the most natural way as making a claim about the effect of moral judgment of the kinds of moral judgments that people consciously make and endorse, then the hypothesis, the original Nob hypothesis, is simply mistaken. <clears throat> 
The problem emerges, I think, very cleanly uh, in a study done by David Pizarro and Paul Bloom in conjunction with Joshua. So uh, just um, indicating again the nicely collaborative nature of work in this area uh, that even people who refute you collaborate with you. All right, uh, so this study was done on uh, liberal university students who were given Nob-style vignettes looking at the um, uh, intentionality of side effects. Uh, uh, I won't give you the whole story, uh, but an advertising executive approves an ad campaign, ad campaign which has either the side effect of encouraging interracial sex or encouraging placing gardenias in one's office. Okay? Well, none of the participants in this study judged that interracial sex was morally wrong, and you'll be relieved to know that none of them thought placing gardenias in their office was morally wrong either. Nonetheless, the participants were much more inclined to say that the executive intentionally encouraged interracial sex uh, than uh, <clears throat> that he intentionally encouraged gardenia placing. So it looks like explicit moral judgments can't explain the difference in judgments about intentionality of side effects. But uh, <clears throat> following Pizarro and Bloom, uh, Joshua has recently proposed uh, that perhaps participants are making non-conscious normative judgments of a very special sort here, uh, <clears throat> that the behavior in question violates a norm, a norm that's made salient by the question or situation, even if it's a norm now, they know it is a norm, it's a norm existing somewhere, or it can be articulated as a norm, or maybe even it's a norm for some people in their culture, even if it's a norm that they explicitly reject. So the picture that Joshua has now been proposing in the last year or so, a uh, year and a half, looks like this. In reaching a conscious moral judgment, we can consider a variety of different moral norms, weigh the norms against each other, and perhaps even determine that some of the norms are themselves unjustified and shouldn't be taken into account at all. The non-conscious moral judgments are, <clears throat> are formed through a much simpler, a sort of system one style automatic process. They're formed extremely quickly and involve very shallow processing. And in generating a non-conscious moral judgment, the only norms we consider are the ones that come first to mind, typically ones generated by, evoked by uh, the scenario itself. We don't search for additional norms. We don't weigh the norms against one another. Uh, we don't uh, ask whether any of the norms that are being effective in this process are, are uh, justified or unjustified. Instead, we simply, on this picture, determine whether the behavior in question violates any of the norms in the very limited set of norms we're considering. And if it does, we classify it as a transgression. This is intended as a technical term. We classify it, uh, we mark it in a certain way. Uh, and it's uh, that classification as a transgression uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> then influences our intuitions about intentional action. Okay? So that's the picture, this system one process that says, does it fly in the face of any norm that this uh, scenario or this vignette brought to mind? Uh, <clears throat> if so, that influences our uh, judgments about intentional action. Well, notice the theory predicts that, most salient, uh, uh, <clears throat> that the most salient norms evoked by a given case will be the ones used in making intentionality judgments, even if subsequent reflection leads the agent to think there's nothing wrong with violating the norm or maybe even that violating that norm would be a very good thing to do. And here's one vignette that Joshua has recently used uh, to test this idea. Uh, <clears throat> in Nazi Germany, there was a law called the Racial Identification Law. The purpose of the law was to help identify people of certain races so they could be rounded up and sent to concentration camps. Shortly after this law was passed, the CEO of a small corporation decided to make a certain, orga certain organizational changes. The vice president of the corporation said, by mo making those changes, you'll definitely be increasing our profits, but you'll be violating, or in the other case, of course, fulfilling, the requirements of the racial identification law. The CEO said, look, 
I know that I'll be violating, fulfilling uh, the requirements of the law, but I don't care one bit about that. All I care about is making as much profit as I can. Let's make those organizational changes. As soon as the CEO gave this order, the corporation began making the organizational changes. Well, in this study, 81% of the subjects uh, in the violate condition said he violated the requirements intentionally, whereas only 30% uh, in the fulfill condition said he fulfilled the requirements intentionally. Well, <clears throat> what to say about all of this? Uh, this theory I've just sketched for you um, is certainly, and Joshua wouldn't suggest this for a moment, of course, it's certainly not the last word on how intentionality judgments are generated. Uh, this work has inspired dozens of other researchers. Uh, there are many studies I haven't told you about already in the literature, and many others are underway as we speak. But if Joshua's theory is on the right track, then intentionality judgments, notice, are produced, they're the product of a kludgy architecture, which can be influenced by norms and judgments which the agent First of all, is not even aware are influencing her decisions. And secondly, the agent doesn't even endorse. Indeed, in some cases, like presumably the racial identification case, uh, the agent explicitly rejects them. Well, both the work uh, of Dan Kelly that I told you about earlier and Joshua's work, uh, <clears throat> I think, support the hypothesis that motivate the talk. Oh, that's the hypothesis that the psychological mechanism or mechanisms underlying moral intuition is a hodgepodge of multi-purpose kludges. Well, suppose that's right. What should we conclude about the use of moral intuition? I think the answer is not that all moral intuition should be rejected. And I need to interpret this, by the way, in a particular way. What I have in mind here is what we shouldn't infer is the content of any particular moral intuition, the content that this particular act is wrong or right or whatever it may be, or intentional for that matter, should not be rejected uh, <clears throat> uh, for all moral intuitions. Uh, <clears throat> indeed, I don't even think uh, that the right conclusion to draw uh, is that intuitions or the contents of intuitions that are closely tied to kludgy features of the mind should be rejected. Because, in fact, I think Sometimes those kludgy features of the mind have remarkably admirable consequences. My favorite example uh, argued for in, by Sean Nichols in his book uh, is that uh, the cultural evolution of norms uh, <clears throat> uh, that increased the scope and acceptance of norms prohibiting physical harm, uh, that cultural evolutionary process uh, was itself profoundly influenced by, indeed, the product of a kludgy design. Uh, so a blanket rejection of moral intuitions or the contents of moral intuitions or even the ones linked to the kludgy features of the mind, if we can dissect them out, uh, doesn't seem to me to be the right way to go. Rather, what I want to suggest uh, is that uh, <clears throat> uh, all moral intuitions should be viewed with a healthy dose of skepticism. Why? Well, because the mechanism that gave rise to them may not have been well designed to do anything. So uh, one rough way of making the point here is that we should be skeptical about moral intuitions for roughly the same reason we should be skeptical about the output of a kludgy piece of computer software. If you know it's slapped together uh, from pre-existing pieces uh, <clears throat> generating odd consequences that are serving no good purpose, uh, then that's a reason to be generally skeptical. That isn't to say to reject it, just to be uh, very doubting about uh, <clears throat> what moral intuition is telling us. All right, well, let me uh, finish uh, with a, a couple of slides. First of all, a compare and contrast. So people, by the time they get to this point, often ask, so how exactly do you differ from the other guys? Well, the friends of intuition, uh, people like the moral sense theorists, uh, Hutchinson, others, uh, <clears throat> ideal observer theorists, uh, think that the system producing moral intuition is well designed, and it's well designed for morally important goals. Certainly for Hutchinson, it's designed by God for a morally important goal. Although, of course, it can sometimes misfire uh, when it's, 
put in unfavorable surroundings like any other system. The previous enemies of intuition, uh, with, which we ha- with whom we have some sympathy, uh, like Peter Singer, also think that the system producing moral intuition has been well designed. But Singer suggests it's been well designed for morally problematic goals, and that's why we should be skeptical of the intuitions. What we've been suggesting uh, is that the system that's producing them is, in large measure, a kludge. It hasn't been well designed for anything. Well, last question. If we should be skeptical about all moral intuition, not reject them outright, not consider them to be false, just be skeptical, you might well ask, indeed, I'm sure Stephen Davis would ask, uh, how can we go about making moral decisions? The answer is, that's a big question, and a very hard one, and perhaps I'll be able to suggest an answer uh, the next time I come to Paris.